Okay, welcome everyone. We're now ready to get started. Uh, I'm Paul Bills. I'm co-president of the English Society. Uh, Tara Pina is the president of the English Society. Jared Pence is with the Graduate Student Association. Uh, he's done a lot of work with us. I'm sure there's a lot more people in this room that have done a lot of work on this as well. Um, this is the schedule as it stands now. If you go to englishsymposium.byu.edu, go to conference program down to 2014, you can see all the panels, all your names. You can start advertising to everyone you know that they should come and see everyone's panels. Um, awesome. So this is the uh, presentation etiquette night. Is that what we call it? Uh, and Dr. Burton, got Dr. Gideon Burton, English professor, will uh, be presenting for us today. Dr. Burton has been at BYU for since 1994. Yeah, since 1994, uh, he specializes in rhetoric and applies that to the digital world. Uh, and he'll be teaching us and presenting for us on digi digital, no, on presentation etiquette. <laughs> we'll now turn the time over to Dr. Burton. Hi, everybody. I'm Gideon Burton. Oh, well, that's, that's the etiquette, right? I didn't actually, I was not told this was an etiquette thing. And really, I just brought my favorite lecture on Milton, so. Um, boy, etiquette just sounds like uh, make sure that you, you know, get the little boogers out of your nose before you speak sort of thing, which is good. But I, I want to talk to you about some more general principles about presentation. And, and I assume that for most of you, this may be the first time that you've spoken at an, an academic conference. So I want to kind of give you that framework, help you to understand what sort of beast it is and how to tame it. Um, I have a presentation booted up here. And I decided to call it How to Present kick buttedly. Um, I, I don't know why, I just did. Um, of course, one of the things we'll talk about is technology, and there's this, there's this moment of anticipation where will it work or will it not work, and that's one of the things you do have to deal with. It works! All right. Um, first principle, and by the way, I have quotations up here, and if, if someone can shout out the source of the quotation, I have a package of stale M&Ms to give you. <laughs> so I'm going to get those M&Ms out, give you a chance to think about that. Anyone have the quotation? Ever heard that before? Huh? Really? You've never heard of that? Yes. It is Hamlet. <laughs> Act 1, scene 5, time is out of joint, and Hamlet's mad that he has to set things right. What's your name? Tyler. Tyler, are you ready for some stale M&Ms? These could hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, suddenly, the wrists go up. You know how they tell you if you're teaching primary, don't use candy as a bribe for people? Well, that's just for primary. Bring candy if you want. People will be happy. <laughs> um, if you do not observe the time, no one will listen to you. They will hate you. I want you to remember, well, OK, that was overstated. OK, maybe it wasn't overstated. I want you to recall back to that time when the high council speaker in your ward got up at you know five minutes to the hour to give his 20 minute long talk, and how you indulge him for about 10 minutes, but then as it gets into the time for the closing song, your tension starts to wane. First you're a little bit indulgent, he's telling a pretty good story, then pretty soon you're like, we, I have a primary lesson to teach and this guy is encroaching on my time. And suddenly, <laughs> even if the sermon was on charity, you're out of charity, right? Think about that, think. Your audience will indulge you for the full amount of time that you have but they will turn into a vicious mob with torches and pitchforks. And you know this because you are that mob. <laughs> and you will bring your pitches and pit those tor whatever I just said. <laughs> okay. Um, 
how much time do you have? 15 minutes. So really, I think that you have more like 13 minutes, and then you'll be on the safe side. Uh, next principle. Anyone know this one? Speak the speech, I pray you, trippingly on the tongue. Midsummer Night Stream, right author, wrong play. It's from Hamlet, it is from Hamlet. Who said that? <laughs> if if you want your M and M's, though, you're gonna have to do better than that. No, like where in the play? When he's speaking to the actors who have put on. Excellent. I'm gonna hand over. <laughs> <laughs> Um, look at this woman. Does she look like that she's enjoying what she's talking about? Does it look like maybe she's practiced her speech so that it goes trippingly on the tongue and not, you know, saying things wrong? Yeah. So be like her. And uh, practice and prepare. Now, the practice part would be practicing your, your speaking part, but the preparation part might be some other things, like the technology, we'll talk about that in a second, like um, maybe if you're going to have an activity as part of your presentation. Uh, like, see, I prepared by finding this, this uh, set of M&Ms that was growing mold in the bottom of my desk. And, and now I'm ready. OK, so <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be tons of preparation, but you kind of want to think about the moment and and the dynamics of what's going to happen. And if you don't know what those are, then let me just tell you. You have um, a faculty member who, usually it's a faculty member, maybe a grad student, who will be the uh, moderator, who will make introductions, uh, brief introductions, and then turn the time over to the first speaker. And that person will go 15 minutes, then the second, then the third, and there will be about, what, 10 minutes left for some discussion time. Um, you don't want to be the person that everybody hates because there wasn't any discussion time left over. So what was principle number one again? Time. Time. Yeah. It really, really, it really matters. Um, how much time does it take to read one page of a manuscript paper? A minute and a half, I hear. Two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Depends on how fast you read and, and how fast the material should be read, but um, you know, general rule of thumb, you, you you might count on about one minute per page or more, but don't trust that. Find out for yourself in actually practicing and seeing what your timing is. <laughs> Chances are, you will not be able to deliver your entire research paper, which means that you have to do some judicious cutting. Okay. And I'll come back to that in a bit. But that's part of the preparation as well, is figuring out what I'm actually going to present. Any of you ever do any, any uh, drama, any acting, been on the stage, had to memorize a part? Anyone do that before? OK, first thing you do you know, when your director gathers you around, congratulations, you're in the play. Let's take out the play, and let's make the cuts now. We're not going to do that, or, or they'll pass out the script where the cuts have already been made. It's, consider the research paper that you've written as a script that you will give you cues to say something interesting and to engage in a performance rather than it being just a, a recitation. Okay? Now, I realize not everyone is, is um, you know, the bouncing off the walls, charisma type. And frankly, a lot of us English majors are rather reserved and, and more modest and not outlandish. But you, you need to find a way to have some energy in what you're doing so that you will connect with people. And so part of your preparation may be practicing your, your um, well-crafted thoughts that were written in silence aloud. And along the way, you'll discover some areas where you should have revised your paper. But uh, instead of revising your paper, revise the presentation of your paper and figure out a good way to say it and to perform it rather than just to read it. OK, um, so you might want to find an empty classroom and uh, practice in that classroom. Um, 
so you're kind of used to the very environment where you will be speaking. The program's up. I don't know if the room numbers are up. So you can go to the very room where you're, you know, you could like plant your lucky rabbit's foot somewhere in the room and, and put a package of starbursts over here and whatever. <laughs> Just, it takes some of the pressure out if you know where you're going to be speaking. Um, I wish I'd done that today. Haven't taken my own advice and prepared as well as I could have. And I came here and the computer monitor is just a little different than I'm used to. And I'm really off my game. I just hope I make it through. <laughs> okay. Anyone know this quote? What are these so withered and so wild in their attire that look not, on, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are on it? Yes. It's from Macbeth. Very good, Lizzie. <laughs> Obviously, I did not prepare on the throwing the M&Ms thing. I practiced with the peanut M&Ms, and these are a different weight. <laughs> All right. I don't know who this guy is, but I don't want him talking to me at an academic conference. <clears throat> He's got some goofy T-shirt on and a shirt that has never been ironed. Okay? And if we look very closely, he probably hasn't shaved in a day or two. Honor code violation. Get him out. Um, Be your best, you know, dress for success. Make it a special day. I put on a tie for you guys today. All day long, wearing my blue shirt and my red tie. It was part of my mental prep because I knew I had to be on my game to give a presentation, right? So dress for success. And here's a little, you know. In case you're not quite sure how to part your hair, go for that. All right. I teach rhetoric, so I had to do this. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Yes. Julius Caesar. Very good. Remind me of your name. Jane. Are you sure? Because yes. I thought you were someone else. No. Nope. <laughs> there you go. Julius Caesar. Um, anyone know who was speaking or what the occasion was for the speaking? Mark Antony was speaking. Caesar had recently been murdered. Bodies right in front of him. Funeral speech sort of thing, right? You don't want this to be your funeral speech. That wasn't why I put the quote up there. Um, we tend to have a focus on our individual product, the thing that we spent such time crafting with all of our blood, sweat, and adverbs. And that's good, because you made a good thing, and you got accepted for presentation. But you need to shift your focus now, and it needs to be about the people, right? I mean, you need to actually try to communicate, rather than just, there happen to be people in the room while I'm reading my paper aloud. It's exercising a different part of your brain. We really don't practice much in terms of oral presentation. Occasionally do a group presentation. Um, so that's why we have meetings like this, to prep you so that just to remind you that you, you, your oral skills of communication differ than your written skills. And if you want to get people interested, you have to think about the people that are actually there. Now, if you have done any acting, you know that you can kind of read the crowd. You can tell whether they're paying attention to you or not. And there's a real danger when you're reading an academic paper that you will lose people. In the, in the day of smartphones, people are all too happy to start referring to their Facebook updates instead of listening to that brilliant thing that you put together. I spoke in a sacrament meeting recently, and a brother came up to me afterwards and he gave me the greatest compliment. He said, Gideon, that was such a good talk. I didn't even turn on my iPhone once. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. Your goal is to keep the other people in the room from checking their phones. Can you do it? Right? How many of you are checking your phones right now? Don't raise your hand. No service down here. What's up with that? Hmm. Well, you could still be on Wi-Fi, couldn't you? How many of you are on Wi-Fi right now? There's no Wi-Fi? Oh, you have to pay attention. This is torture. OK, earn the attention of the people in the room, right? Know that they have options. And here's the killer. The other people in the room, are most of them are going to be the other presenters. Guess what's on their mind? 
Right. I mean, you had all this great stuff about um, Milton and Oliver Cromwell, and you put a lot of research into that. No, you were in my Milton class. It was good stuff. And yet someone else is in there wants to talk about Edgar Allan Poe, love Poe, but, okay, you wouldn't be in the same session. That doesn't work. But in any case, <laughs> you can be so caught up in your own presentation that you'll forget that this is an occasion for an exchange, right? So part of it is not just being the orator, the speaker, or the performer. Part of it is being the audience. These people look like they're paying attention, <coughs> right? Sometimes it helps if just act like you're paying attention and fake it till you make it. Then you might actually pay attention. But it, it partly is a courtesy, right? I mean, you want them to do the same thing, to pay attention to what you're saying. So be a good audience member. But it's, it's a lot easier to be a good audience member if the speaker has given some real effort to respect the audience and try to interest the audience. And the rhetorical moves for making a convincing literary argument are not always the same rhetorical moves for engaging a live audience. We've, there's sometimes a real mismatch there. Okay. It's kind of artificial. So we have to push back past that artificiality. I have a couple ideas. Um, take it to the people. Oh, yes, this, this reminds me. This is a good point that uh, my colleague Dennis Cutchins uh, taught me about. And that is, um, this is when, when you go to an academic conference, it's, it's only partly about presenting the ideas that you've worked so hard on. In fact, over time, we that are in the business, really, that's almost a minor part of the whole occasion. Uh, partly because uh, a presentation at a conference is just a midway point on the way to a more formal publication, um, but partly because we go there to network and to enjoy the company of other people. And so I put this up. These, these are conference attendees at some conference. And you see how they're happily engaging one another? And this is outside of the actual setting of the speaking going on. So I want to tell you to prepare for this conference by thinking about the uh, things that are happening at the conference besides just your presentation or even just your session. Use it as a time to bounce ideas off of other people. Um, come a little bit early so you can talk to the people in the hallway. That's what I did today. I was able to talk with a few of you, and it was really fun to hear about what you were going to present on. Okay, uh, if, if you come late because you've just been cramming to prepare, uh, you're going to be kind of selfish about the whole thing. Don't be selfish. Be social. Use the academic conference as a way to connect with your peers on a different level. And it's, it's fun. And you can also connect with the, uh, you know, the moderator, the other faculty members. A lot of people are taking time out of their day to devote to this conference so we can have this you know, celebration of things literary. And so we're all kind of in the same zone. Take advantage. It's fun. It's interesting to hear about other people's ideas. OK, anyone know this one? This is my last M&Ms, even though it's not my last point. So the next point, there's just going to be no motivation to pay attention. Maybe I should open up this and just feed them out one M&M at a time. <laughs> not all right, anyone know this quotation? Oh, reason not the need. Yes? Is that King Lear? That is King Lear. It's, is that Tyler next to you? Tyler's neighbor. Tyler's neighbor? OK, because you both kind of have the same glasses, and I didn't know if you were trying to work something here. Um, what's your name, Tyler's neighbor? Race. Race? OK, everyone pay attention, because this could cut your face. <laughs> Ready, Race? <laughs> I'm calling that a victory. <laughs> okay, silly little things can really help through an academic conference. I'm telling you, what did Mark Twain say about the Book of Mormon? It's chloroform in print. Almost any academic paper is chloroform in print. I'm sorry, guys. This is just reality. You wrote it to be read silently, and yet they're asking you to read it aloud. What's up with that? You've got to find some way to mix it up and make it interesting. And it's not going to be by sitting there and reading every word in a monotone voice until we want to poke needles in our eyes. OK, that's not what this was about. <laughs> Reason not the need. OK, I thought this was kind of cool. Cool. This is this old school presentation going on. 
look at the high tech. <laughs> right? Is that a laser pointer in his right hand? I don't think so. <laughs> no, he's feeling pretty good about himself. He has a stick. He can point to his flannel board there, his easel. Right? High tech. You know what's going to happen to that guy if his easel falls over? His life is ruined. <laughs> he looked like a fool. I had my charts. They were all lined up. Now they're on the floor. <laughs> what am I talking about? Technology problems. What about this guy's PowerPoint presentation? What is it with the visual design? It's taking subtlety a bit too far. OK, he's doing without. He's not using, even though he's got a podium, he probably has the tech set up for it. But he's just standing in front of the room and explaining his ideas with confidence. Sometimes technology is a crutch. I'm using that crutch right now. Am I a hypocrite? <laughs> of course, technology is our friend. It can help to make our points. But you can get trapped in that. If I make a really good PowerPoint, then my presentation will be good. We've all suffered death by PowerPoint and barely been resurrected from that. <laughs> so do not inflict that on your neighbors and friends here. We're we don't want to kill one another with death by PowerPoint. What is death by PowerPoint? That's kind of this phrase. What does it refer to? Yeah, if, if you just have a bunch of slides and then uh, it's almost insulting to the, the people there that, OK, maybe you can read or maybe you can't. So I'm just going to err on the side of caution here and read every word that's on the screen. <laughs> My first point, blah, blah, blah. Point two, right? Um, I'm not saying that you can't use PowerPoint. If you choose to use media, you need to make sure that you're in a tech room. Are most of the rooms tech rooms, or we do, do we know? I think most of them. Almost all. There's yeah. just a few not. OK. Now, a minute ago, I was getting my knickers in a twist about boring reading of an academic paper. And so you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe if I do a good PowerPoint, then that'll help. Yeah, that could be one way to help. Give people something to pay attention to, some visuals that can help you along. But be modest. Be modest in your uses of media, because it can gobble up your time, and it can distract you from communicating, ironically. Um, you can be so caught up in whether the slide transitions worked and such and such that, that you forget that you actually have an audience, and your PowerPoint or whatever your technology becomes your audience. It becomes the thing you're caring about more than the subject of your paper. Now, there's ways around that if you're well prepared and you practice with your technology, then, then you should be all right. Um, you would even feel safest if you went to that room ahead of time, got familiar with the console and everything, pulled up your presentation, were able to go through it readily all beforehand. If you do that, you'd feel really comfortable going in there. It's like there are not going to be any surprises. I know that this I have to jiggle here, or I have to you know, turn the lights off such and such a way. So I'm not telling you not to use technology. But I am telling you to be prepared if you do. And keep it simple if you do. Um, there are some really good principles if you are going to make some slides. I'm using the Prezi presentation format. Are some of you familiar with that? P-R-E-Z-I. Some of you ever used that before? Prezi? It's starting to be a, a challenger to PowerPoint, and partly because it has you know, the zoomable features, and you can kind of make people have seizures from going <laughs> disoriented ways. And, so you know, be, be careful about overdoing it with that. Um, so that's an option, and, and so is PowerPoint. Um, these are not the only ways that you can show visuals. I was making fun of that guy with the easel. You could bring in an easel. It'd kind of be a novelty nowadays, right? Check this out. I got a flannel board. <laughs> Everybody sees PowerPoint presentations. Rub it. It's flannel. <laughs> you can stick things to it. Look at that. Um, I, don't, I don't want to go through a, a presentation on um, effective uses of PowerPoint, but I will refer you to one that I had it up on the screen if some of you saw it as, as you're walking in. And at the end of this presentation, I give a link to that that you can look at if you want. Um, but it's nowadays there's there's no excuse for us to use these presentation tools um, without some intelligence. So please 
think about that. And, and if I could just insert one really basic idea is simplicity of design. And do not overcrowd your slides with lots of text. I think this is a good example. It's kind of this inspirational quote. The speaker can kind of build off of that. You notice how I'm doing it as well. You don't see a lot of text on each one of the slides that, that I go to here. It's, it's just a, a, a launching point for what I'm presenting rather than as a, a surrogate or an avatar of my presentation. All right, so keep it simple and even ask yourself, can I do without, right? Maybe the power of the human voice and some good eye contact and some gestures can actually deliver the goods better than some technology. Um, okay, now, um, I didn't expect you to know this when I ran out of candy anyway. This is from King John. Can you not read it? Is it not fair writ? I've already been alluding to this, but I I'm going to show you three pictures here, and you're going to get my point. Wh which of these are likely to be more engaging presenters? This guy, this guy, it's Norman Mailer, or this woman? Okay, let me put it this way. If, if you had to go and listen to a presentation, how many of you would like to listen to guy number one at the top? Just raise your hand. You also have a love for loose leaves. And you got a binder, I'm there. I'm with you, buddy. I love, love reading like that. How about Norman Mailer? Even if you didn't know it's Norman Mailer, famous author, doesn't this guy look like he's either just about to have a great epiphany or a heart attack. <laughs> and either way, you're going to pay attention, right? There's going to be sirens of a literal or a metaphorical type on the way. Right? So he's trying to connect with his audience. He's using some gestures. I love that, that woman. Look at her. Although it kind of, it's almost a kind of Nazi-esque sort of you know, ideological <laughs> rant going on here. You don't need to go that far, you know? Have any of you seen the, the, that episode of The Office where Dwight is giving the speech at the sales <laughs> meeting? And he's, he's like repeating a speech from Mussolini or something like that. And it was so energizing for everyone, right? That's interesting because, of course, they weren't really closely listening to the content. They were just being rallied to the cause. There's something powerful about a powerful delivery um, regardless of the content. Of course, we, you already have good content, so let's blend a, a happy delivery with some, some good content. And uh, maybe you need to practice your gestures, right? <coughs> I don't know. Is that silly? Maybe it's a little silly. But you might try reading in front of a mirror, right? And, and just kind of seeing. Or, or if you dare, set up a, a, your camera, your phone on video or something and, and watch yourself presenting. And then go back and watch it and, and think, OK, well, how could I do that and maybe have more eye contact in the middle of that? Or maybe I could interrupt what I'm doing and ask a question. You notice how the, I've been doing that? that I've, I haven't just been giving you a monologue. There have been several points where I've asked for minor but important feedback from the audience to keep them engaged. You might go through the text of your, your manuscript and, and uh, even mark little places where you could insert, you could pause and ask a question. Today I'm going to be talking about the great story of the Cask of Amontillado from Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, what's your name again? Audrey. Audrey's doing that, yes? And Audrey, she could pause and say, have any of you ever read that before? And already, it's like, oh, this is, this is a friendly little back and forth. OK. And one of you goes, well, yes, I have read that, plus all of Poe's complete works. And so you're like, yes, I have read it, right? Or someone else says, before I was a Mormon, I drank wine. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I guess an, a little side note is you need to keep control of your audience, and so you don't want to get carried away with your wine bibbery or whatever. <laughs> um, but back to my point, and that is if, you, if you're practicing as you should practice, you may want to think in your mind, how can I engage the people? How many of you have taught primary before? OK. How many of you will eventually teach primary? All hands will go up. Okay. The, the church is really good about having attention activities and keeping things simple, right? No, but wait a minute, I'm, I'm talking to people that are college age, and I use big words like deconstruction. And OK, that's good. But pull back a little and pretend as though 
the people that you're talking to have not just been through a whole semester where they, they really got into the guts of Derrida, right, Ben? Not everybody knows about Derrida. And some people, when they hear his word, they start to break out into a sweat. Any of you sweating right now? I am just a little bit. So you could be patient and say, you know, I'm not going to assume that you know what Derrida is all about, so I'm going to tell you about this one concept of difference and what, it's, what it means. It might mean that you need to kind of slow down and spell out a concept or two, which in your paper you didn't feel you need to because you were kind of imagining talking to your fellow class members or your teacher who already knew all this stuff, right? Think about your audience. Now, some of you might be getting nervous here because it sounds as though I'm saying that you have to revise your paper in order to present it. Now, I'm just saying you need to um, revisit it so that you, it's in an adequate format for an effective presentation. At the very least, you need to cut it within the time. But I'm also suggesting that you find ways of having moments of audience interaction and so that it's not just a straightforward monologue. And you could also interrupt it with some activities. And that's kind of what I think I've already... Um, oh, okay. Now, um, this, this uh, other... This blog post that I'll refer you to at the end of this presentation um, talks about four principles of really good presentations. And I think these are, these are really powerful. And in giving them to you, I want to put it in the category of for what it's worth and not you have to do it this way. I'm just saying this is a really effective way of good presentations. And so you might kind of look at that list and then look at your paper and say, is there any way that I could sort of take those principles and apply them to this paper? So think of it that way. You'll be able to think of it that way if you're willing to let go of some of your precious paragraphs, right? They got you that A on your paper. They serve their purpose. But it might be that you don't need to actually read every paragraph of your paper. In fact, it might be that people will be more interested in your subject if you just kind of talked your paper through rather than read every word. I don't know if that's how you were conceiving this when you got your paper accepted. I got my paper accepted, mean, that means I get to go and read my paper. Okay, but what if you're trying to serve your subject and your audience rather than serving the memory of a moment where you put all these ideas down in eight to 10 pages? Okay, just think about that. So here's this, here are these four principles that, that are really effective. First of all is to show your passion. Now at BYU, we have to have that within certain bounds. And, so please, in showing your passion, you know, keep your clothing on and, and your language clean and, and uh, clear which animals you bring. Um, but you can show your passion about anything. And look, if, you, if I don't believe that you're interested in this, I certainly am not going to be interested in it. Okay? Even if it's something that I'm supposed to be interested in. You know, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, everyone's supposed to know him and be interested in him, but... I really don't care. Um, but if, is it Audrey? Yes. If Audrey is up there and she says, the cask of Amontillado. <laughs> I'm just brutalizing this, sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. But if she shows some sort of passion about it, oh, I don't mean to be ridiculous about this. I just mean to show some energy, right? One way of showing the passion is to tell a story. Okay. What if instead of reading your paper, paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, that you kind of just set that aside? You know it's there. You can refer to it. You can quote from it. There are some good parts you've highlighted. But what if instead of doing that, you told the story of your paper? Not the boring parts, but maybe the parts where you discovered it. I, I really didn't think that I would get into this, this text. And yet, I did. And I started connecting because of such and such. And, it, and then we brought up this one theory in class. And so-and-so comment, commented on it. And then we started doing research. And I found this one guy who said this ridiculous thing. And I thought, i got to set him straight. Suddenly, I'm writing my paper. And I came up with this, right? <laughs> and I mean, I just made that up on the spot. And I didn't have any specifics in there. But you're already ready to hear my imaginary paper, aren't you? You're, you're engaged because I showed some passion about it, right? So if you have a real thing, things that you really have invested in, these ideas you spend a lot of time with, these authors, these texts, you love them. They mean something to you. They shaped you. They informed you. They're part of what's made you an English major, right? So 
let your light shine about that. Let us feel that you care about it. And one way to do that is to tell a story about it. It doesn't have to be the story of the paper. It could be a story that um, is maybe a story from the life of the author of the work that you're talking about. Or it could be a story of the reception of the play that you're discussing. Or it could be a story of um, uh, your, your um, I just ran out of a last example. But tell a story. People are engaged in, in those, and, and they connect with those. Make a claim. Now, you say, well, I already have a thesis statement. OK, well, that, that can be your claim. But you could also have a claim as to why we should care about your claim. And what, what's the, what are the stakes here? OK, I, I proved to you that, uh, uh, what's, your, what's your claim then about Cromwell again? I forgot. All right, so you're making a claim that says that Oliver Cromwell is part of what informed the creation of the character of Satan in Paradise Lost, right? Okay. Um, and that's, that's interesting, but I know it's interesting because I know something about the history and the literature, but others may not know that. And so, you know, maybe there's a larger story here, the, the larger impact of your claim. You should pay attention to this because it will change the way that you think about one of our most important works of literature, all right? Um, you can make a claim about your, the importance of what you're doing. And finally, there can be a call to action. Now, what is that? It sounds like a sales term. It is a sales term. But it's, it's something, it's an invitation for engagement that goes beyond the moment. So here's a couple of ideas. Keep it simple. Um, invite people to read your complete paper. Now, I've only been able to sketch a few of the points from here because I only had 15 minutes, and some of the paper was kind of dense, and so I really only got to a few of the major points, but I've really sold it to you. And so someone is like, can I have a copy of that? I'd really like to read the whole thing. What a great compliment it would be to you if someone said that, right? Now, you'd have to be prepared and either have copies of it or be able to give them a link to where they could find it online. But think of that as a, a call to action. At the end of this, I want you not to just walk away, but to look at it in a more formal way by reading my paper. Um, another call to action is to have people, to challenge people to, to tell someone about it. You know, there's, there's a human interest angle probably to almost any work of literature. Um, you, you try to find a scenario in which it would be relevant to people beyond just the few people that are talking to one another about it. More and more, I have faith that the things we study as literature majors have broad significance to our extended families and our loved ones and people that would never pick up a book on their own. It just is a matter of our willingness to build a bridge of relevance to those people. And, and they will care if, if you can communicate it well. So, you know, what you're doing inside of the academic conference is maybe a kind of practice for a kind of discourse you can have, conversations you can have beyond it to people that aren't academics, but may be interested in it anyway. I had a student a while ago who, and I was challenging them to, to take this seriously and take their ideas, take them out on the street and find out that pe real people, everyday people, care about your things. Well, he actually did go out on the street. He found some homeless guy under a bridge in Provo and said, I'm going to have a conversation with you about Shakespeare. Guess what? This guy says, oh, I love Hamlet. And he started going <laughs> reciting passages. And it's like, oh my gosh, if you graduate with an English major, you'll end up homeless. <laughs> No, that wasn't it. The, the, oh my gosh, people really do connect with this. I had another um, uh, group of students who were studying Henry V, and if you know that play, you know it's, there's that St. Crispin's Day speech, we few, we happy few, that's a very thrilling speech. Well, they went and talked to some guys in the ROTC program. They're not English majors, okay? I don't know what you study if you're in ROTC. Military Ro science. Military science, okay. And, uh, so they want to get their opinions about some of the military angles on Henry V and just, you know, humor us. We want to talk to you about a Shakespeare play. I kid you not, two of the cadets, they dropped what they're doing and recited the entire St. Crispin's Day speech. Have a little faith that what you're talking about has relevance beyond just this present semester or this conference, that it can matter to other people. And so think of this conference as a, uh, 
a first run at practicing communicating your ideas more generally to people. Lizzie? Yes, and also, I've, I've attended the English Symposium for the past, for the past two years in a row, and I found that both times I've gone that I've been able to get something personal about the panels I attended. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you can invite people to talk to you after the session or at another time. You know, give them your email address or something like that. Um, and you could invite them to go to a, a, a website where they can get more information. And uh, I use the, the Bitly service so I can give a named URL that you could remember and so people don't have to be writing down a long web address. And if you actually go to this, this it will take you to that um, blog post I mentioned that talks about principles of, of effective presentations. So that's one thing that you could do. Give people something that they can act on outside of the moment. And that could be as simple as bringing a couple copies of your paper with you and handing it out. Or it could be handing them that. Um, I didn't mention handouts in general. Uh, if you want to use a handout, that's a good way of maybe um, having some quotations or some other things that maybe you're not going to take the time to read full text from your paper. And you could put those on a handout and say, well, there's this great quote about free speech from Milton Zari Pajitica, but it's a little long and wordy, so I've just put it on the handout for you to read on your own, but I'll just kind of refer to the concepts from it. Um, you, or you could put an outline, or you could do whatever else, but you could give some, something for them to look at while, while they are listening to you talk. Okay. Um, I guess I just wanted to wrap up by having just this, I don't want you to actually cause a revolution, just the, the kind of the spirit of vitality and change. Ideas are supposed to change you, you know? I, I love that quote from Franz Kafka about a book should be an ice for the frozen sea within us, you know? It's like, yes, this stuff changes things. It makes a difference. It's not just some namby-pamby thing we close ourselves off and read and get all aesthetic and whatever. These ideas matter. Convey it. Convince me. Tell them. Let's, let's make sure that you believe it, and then they will, okay? And, and then last of all, it really is about the people. It's not about the paper, right? You're there to give a paper. Well, give the paper. Don't give the paper. Does that make sense? Anyway, what I'm saying is don't serve the paper. Serve the people. Use the paper as a medium to make other people's lives better for 15 minutes because you had some really cool ideas. Okay, that'll just take some rehearsing, a little changing of a frame of mind. And so I'm, I'm done now, and I'll have just a little bit of Q&A. Um, and then we have a very short activity to wrap up, and we'll be out of here early. So do you have questions about presentation? Yes? You said that there's 15 minutes each, but if you're on a panel, is it still 15 minutes each? How does it work? Okay. Other and questions? Oh, oh, and I was just going to say, and the professor who's there in the room with you or the person who's the moderator usually knows your subject, and they will come up with some questions. They'll like guide the discussion and, and help so that you don't have to be, feel like you're in charge of the whole discussion afterwards. So. Yes. So we won't have questions within our 15-minute no. period? No. No. We'll only do questions after everyone Yes. That's sometimes done differently at different conferences. This is how we're doing it for this one. That can add a level of like competition. Do you want to have all the questions you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you have any other questions? Yes. Okay, that's good. All right, let's have a brief final activity. What I'd like you to do is to um, pair up with someone that's close to you and briefly tell them about what you're presenting on and try to do it with some enthusiasm. Get them interested in it. Once, once you're done, then do we have any finalizing comments before we do this?
Foreign Language Activity Center yeah, right across the hall here. Okay. Just or talk. We'll, just we'll be English if you have oh, just, an invite guest. Oh yes, everybody. Feel free to invite your parents. Your you don't have to be an English major to come. So. A news reporter. <laughs> Former babysitters. <laughs> All right. Do this. Take two minutes and explain your paper to someone next to you, and then you can go.